Chris Lopez here, and I'll run you through this house hacking spreadsheet. So an important note is that this spreadsheet is actually built upon Joe Massey's popular investment rental property analysis spreadsheet, which is this one right here on your screen. So if you follow us for any length of time, you're probably already familiar with this spreadsheet and have used it. So it'll make using this spreadsheet a lot easier as well. And we're actually using this as a foundation for this spreadsheet. So Joe, thanks for letting us do that. All right, let's run through this model overview. So I'm assuming that you're buying a property to house hack, which is where you buy a property, you live there, and then you either rent out the extra bedrooms or the other unit, depending on the property style. And the basic assumption of the spreadsheet is that, or the default assumption is that you're gonna live for free. Now, if you're actually making some money or you're still having to pay some money for your mortgage, I'll show you how to adjust that later. But the default is that you're gonna be living for free. And then two years later, you buy a similar property and you do the same thing. You live there, you rent out the extra rooms or units. And in the previous property, you keep it and you rent it out to a long-term tenant. Then you repeat that again two years later, repeat it again two years later as well. So after eight years, you now have four rental properties. So a couple more tips. Uh, this spreadsheet is complex, so please watch this whole video before you start playing with it. Uh, there are some areas that you can break in here and then it'll be a pain in the butt for you to figure out what happened. So just like Joe's spreadsheet, fill in the yellow highlighted fields. And so that's these fields that are yellow I'm talking about here. Those are the ones that you can change and adjust and that will impact how the spreadsheet and the rest of the model builds out. Now initially I would say focus only on this variables tab and this cash flow tab and the summary tab before you start clicking any of those other tabs. So get familiar with these first few tabs first before you kind of branch out to the more advanced stuff and I'll show you how all this works as well. And so what this assumes for properties two, three, and four is that you're essentially buying a similar property, but in the future. So if you buy a property for $100,000 now, and then the market appreciates at 5% a year, and you buy another property uh, two years from now, well, it's gonna be $100,000 times 5%, and then $105,000 times 5% that second year to give you that future purchase price. And all the other variables increase as well. Now, I'm using Google Sheets right now to show you this. That's actually what I built it in. I'm a fan of that. Um, if you're using this and want your own copy, let me pull up another document here. Go to File, Make a Copy, and you can copy it over to Google Drive or download as, and you can download it into you know, Microsoft Excel or one of these other formats. So if you're clicking around having trouble, you need to go in there and make a copy. I also put a few resources down here to help you with some other house hacking stuff. So check those out if you've not already seen those. And of course, this spreadsheet and model is just for informational purposes only. All right, so let's jump into the first tab, the variables tab. So the first variable you have is property manager. And this is just saying, yes, I want to use one or no, I don't want to use one. So if you say yes, it's not assuming you use a property manager while you live at the property. It only adds in the property management fee once you move out and you're renting it to long-term tenants. Your monthly personal savings, uh, this is how much you're saving per month since you're not spending that money on rent or mortgage. I put $1,000 in there to default it, but of course adjust it to your situation. And what we're gonna do is that cash, so my assumption here is whatever money you normally be spending on rent or mortgage, uh, you take that money and you have it automatically transfer over to a savings account and you let it sit there until it's time to buy the next property. And this last variable is the interest rate increases between your property purchases. Since we're buying a property now, then in two years, then in four years, and in six years, there's a chance interest rates may go up um, there's a chance interest rates may stay the same. So I was conservative. I put, hey, they're gonna go up a half a point between my property now, and then between every property, the interest rate will go up a half a point. 
So you can adjust this to whatever you want to, and it'll impact the financing and the cash flow for properties two, three, and four. So I'm gonna say property manager, no. And then we'll jump to this cash flow tab. Oh, that's not the right tab. We'll jump to this inputs tab for property number one. So I've labeled property one in here, and I recommend you keep, uh, you keep it labeled property one because all the sheets are labeled property one, two, three, and four, and I'll help you know uh, what order and what sheet is assigned to what property. So I changed this down payment percentage that Joe had in his spreadsheet to a drop down that gives the you know four common down payment options for owner occupied. Three and a half percent FHA loan, five percent and ten and fifteen percent conventional. So a couple notes on here. Uh, if three and a half percent down it is an FHA loan, and FHA loans no longer have PMI drop off. As long as you have an FHA loan, you're paying PMI forever is the new rule I just learned that got enacted a couple years ago. If it's a conventional loan at 5, 10, or 15%, then the PMI will drop off at approximately years 9, 6, and 3, respectively. And all those variables are built in the spreadsheet. So I have a 3.5% down payment right now. I'm going to come down to line 52 on PMI, and it shows I'll be paying 1474 a year in PMI. Now, if I change that to 15% down, I'm only gonna be paying about $600 a year in PMI. Now, these numbers are not you know, exact. Uh, Joe gave me a rule of thumb formula to calculate it. And then once you get to whatever year, if it's a 15%, it should drop off around year three, assuming you get to like a 78% uh, equity. Um, it'll automatically drop that payment off of your future cash flow statements. So it should give you a good ballpark here as to uh, you know how your future cash flow will work. So I'm gonna keep it three and a half percent down for this uh, video. Your purchase price, whatever you're paying for the, the property, and of course acquisition cost, repair cost, those variables. Put in the terms of your uh, loan here and then what you're getting for your rent. Now, whatever you put in here will, does not impact the rent you're getting uh, while you're living at the property. This will impact the rent once you move out of the property and you turn it into a long-term rental. Vacancy factor, rent increase, appreciation rate, uh, these variables actually impact future cash flows and actually impact the future price and future rent increases of properties two, three, and four because the other properties are modeled off of these uh, percentages right here. Annual operating data, um, taxes, insurance, repairs and maintenance, put them whatever you want here. Um, this is probably a little high since you'll be living at the property, but do what you want. Uh, HOA dues, this model has a condo, is actually a condo here. Uh, do not actually change this property management field. You can see I turned it white and actually has a line here. Because if you go to the variables page and click property manager, yes. We'll actually come back here and populate in the property manager fee. So if you put it in there, it'll affect future cash flow. If it's not in there, it does not, it will not be added to the future cash flow, or I should say subtracted from the future cash flow. So once you do all of that, um, the basic spreadsheet is done. It'll give you a ballpark, big picture potential for what you could do if you buy a property, stand for two years and repeat and keep doing similar purchases and similar strategy for eight years. It all plays out on this summary tab here. So start off with this line, year one. The personal savings field is coming from this variable of saving $1,000 a month. So if you put in 500, your personal savings goes to $6,000 a year. So I'm gonna keep it at $1,000 because I think that's a just easy round number. Uh, one thing I did forget, if you get confused or lost, uh, definitely look for these little uh, triangles in the corner of the windows. I did put notes in there to help explain what those fields are. 
So a lot of these fields have those. So they should give you an idea of um, yeah, what that does. So cash flow for property one. Now this field is yellow and I have zero in here. Again, my basic assumption is that you're living for free. Now, if you're actually making some money, you can put in, hey, I'm, I'm netting you know, uh, $1,000 a year. Put that in here or you can leave that zero. Or if you're spending money, I'm sorry, if you're actually spending money towards your expenses, you can put a negative number in here or you could actually adjust your personal savings. No right or wrong way, whatever your preference is. And I would recommend you adjust your personal savings to what you can automatically save each month with your basic living expenses account for in there as well. And then what happens is this spreadsheet starts building out. It'll show the equity you have at the end of year one. That's assuming down payment and one year's worth of appreciation and mortgage pay down. And it starts adding up the cash flow, the total property cash flow, and then your total cash in your savings account. So this uh, column here is a sum of your personal savings plus the cash flow you have from your properties. And this is actually what will deduct the future down payments and purchase prices for the next property. So you see here in year two, or between year two and year three, we have $24,000 at year two, but in year three, you have $22,000. Well, that's because, yeah, in year three, you saved another $12,000 and you made $3,700 a year in cash flow. But it actually came back here to this second property, property number two, and subtracted out this total initial investment, which was the down payment plus the other closing cost. And so it builds out down from there. Uh, this last column is net worth. This is simply the sum of uh, the cash in your savings account plus the equity for each of your properties. So at the end of year two, you are now buying your second property here and we subtract the down payment price from your money in your savings account and you actually pay for it cash, no problem. You can even put down a little bit more money if you wanted to as well. Um, so it shows your cash flow from your first property. You're going to start making about $3,700 a year in cash flow and you're at $57,000 equity. Well, now again, you're living for free in property number two. And again, you can put a positive number, negative number, do whatever you want in here to adjust for it. But then it starts building up. So your total property cash flow is now $3,600 a year. Your net worth is already in the six figures, which to me is just astounding. And that's just the power of leverage and the power of the compounding effect of appreciation, the compounding effect of interest. Now, of course, all this assumes that the market goes to historical norms of about a 5% or 6% appreciation, what, 4%, 5% rent increase. Of course, as you plan this and use this, make sure I would recommend you use realistic numbers, but also hope for the best or hope for historical norms, uh, but plan for the worst. If things go sideways for a while, make sure you can still make your numbers work. Because in the long run, these numbers will come back to average as they have probably the last 40 years. So uh, at year four, you're at the end of your second year of living in property number two. Now it's time to buy property number three. And your cash or savings account is $39,000 at the end of year four. And actually goes up, even though you buy your third property here at year five, between the money you're saving and your cash flow, you're actually increasing your savings for that year uh, in your total uh, cash in your savings account. So it's getting cool here. And of course, you can run through the rest of this. Um, and I'll show you a few more things before I go through the rest of the summary field. So let's go back to buying property number two. So all, and just as a note, all of uh, the tabs or spreadsheet tabs uh, that go to property number one, start with the number one dash. Property number two is two dash. And the same thing for property three and four, so helps you stay organized. So I'm going to two dash inputs, which is property two here. And it defaults, it actually does not give you the option to put an FHA loan down here. 
Uh, I'm assuming because you only have one FHA loan at a time. And I didn't want to go through the hassle of putting multiple ones in here and the potential refinancing and all this stuff. So I'm assuming you're using FHA loan for your first one, and then you'll go conventional for the rest of your, uh, the rest of your properties. So you can see here the purchase price is actually $259,000 now. Well, from the property number one, your purchase price was two thirty-five. dollars Well, what happened was $235,000 times two years of an annual 5% appreciation rate brings you to $259,000 purchase price now. So while you're getting the benefit of um, you know, having your property appreciate and your equity and net worth grow, it's also gonna cost you more to buy your future property. So you know the sword cuts both ways. And then the mortgage interest rate from here, from property two to property one, went from 4% to 4.5%. And that's based off of this interest rate right here. So if we change this to 0%, it stays at 4% now. But I like to be conservative. So I'm going to go back and change it to 0.5%. Put in your terms, and again, Rent has increased as well. So it takes the rent from property one, 1850, and then over two years at increasing at 4% a year, puts you at $2,000 a month in rent. Then all the other annual operating data also then increases as well. And again, it calculates your PMI. And if you have property management selected to yes, it'll put the fee in here. If you don't, it'll have it set to no. And so this is why I was saying this gets into the more advanced usage of uh, the spreadsheet. Now, if you want to come in here and type in different numbers for your purchase price, certainly you can do that. Just understand that you're going to break the rest of the spreadsheet or break the previous spreadsheet. So it's no longer this cascading effect of assumptions. You now have to go through and start adjusting for property to property to property. So if you do want to play around with this, I would recommend you make a copy, save it, and then make another copy to kind of play around with things because there's a good chance you'll break it. But that way, if you do, you can still go back to your original copy and have a kind of a keep it simple, silly model to use with these uh, couple of tabs here. All right, so going back to the summary tab here, um, it just kind of keeps repeating. Uh, year three, I'm sorry, property three, year six, you're essentially living for free again, and now you're ready to buy your fourth property. So it subtracts out the down payment, which we can see here under four dash inputs. Uh, your total investment is going to be right around $20,000 now because the property now costs about $315,000. So it's gone up a lot, but your total investment has not gone up nearly as much. And that is the power of leverage right there. And you can see here, just going out to this like, these last couple columns of cash flow and things, it just starts getting unbelievable almost of just you know how much cash and net worth you're building. And I say almost unbelievable because you know this is the power of buying and holding properties for the long term. Now again, this is assuming that everything goes to the exact norms of the variables we put in there, which we know it won't happen. Uh, could the market keep going gangbusters like it's done the last couple of years? It could. Will it? Who knows? What's the probability? Yeah, who knows either? Could it go flat? Could it go negative? It could do all those things. So I would recommend you play around with these variables in your input one here. Uh, okay, well, what happens if if rent increases don't uh, go nearly as much? What happens if we just start going like we just we, we plateau for a bit and are you know not even keeping up with inflation? What does that do to my long term summary here? And you can see it changes your cash flow, it changes your net worth, it changes all of these things. But in the long run, these numbers still look incredibly impressive as you get down to year 10. Hey, you still have over a half a million dollar net worth. You're still making $18,000 a year in cash flow, assuming rent increase is 1% a year for 10 years. Now, that is a very pessimistic view. Um, but these are things I'd recommend you play around with just so you can kind of help plan 
you know, I kind of hope for the best, but plan for the worst type attitude. That way, if anything happens, you can handle it. You can ride out a speed bump because I truly believe as long as you can hold on to real estate in the long run, you're going to be a wealthy, a wealthy person down the road. So play around with those variables and uh, have fun with this uh, summary statement and playing around with the spreadsheet. So this spreadsheet is still a work in progress. I just started building this about two weeks ago from the date I'm recording this original video. You can see here it shows version 1.1. So a couple things, make sure you're on our email list at denverinvestmentrealestate.com because as I come up with new versions, I will send out an email blast to the email list. So you can come download the latest version. And you know there'll be everything from doing some fixing a few issues I find or that people report to me in the spreadsheet or adding some more features in there as well. So make sure you kind of keep an eye on your email and what version you're using as to what we have on the website. All right, if you have any questions, reach out to me and I'll do my best to help you out. And just on an ending note, I know we have all sorts of people using the spreadsheet and watching this video. Um, from clients I'm working with to potential clients to other realtors. So if you're one of my clients or someone that's looking for a realtor to work with, absolutely reach out to me. I can help you fine tune some stuff, put together a model. If you are a, uh, an investor out there working with another agent, great. Use a spreadsheet and work with your agent. You guys come up with a game plan to go out there and help you buy a property. If you're an agent out there, use a spreadsheet to help you go out there with your clients. Obviously, if you're an agent or you're a client with someone else, I can't spend nearly as much time helping you just because I need to focus on also building my business. But I'll be happy to do what I can to help anyone out there. Again, email me at chris at denverinvestmentrealestate.com. Thanks.